All right. Good morning, everybody. Thanks, guys. If you all want to take your seats, we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you, guys. All right, it's time for chapel now. So welcome to chapel, everybody. Um, Today, rather than worshiping through song like we usually do, uh, we're going to change things up a little bit, and we're going to worship through prayer. Uh, So what we're going to do, if you all could get into groups of like three, maybe four, uh, you can go up on the bleachers, you can stay down here on the floor, you can rearrange the chairs and get together, whatever you want to do. Just get together into groups of like three or four people, um, and then we'll have some... Uh, It'll be like some guided prayer time. So if you guys can get in those groups right now, as quick as you can. All right, and we're going to start off uh, by reading Daniel 9, 18. Uh, it says, We do not make requests of you because we are righteous, but because of your great mercy. Uh, I think that's a really, good, a really good verse to remind us that, you know, just because you know, we're not praying because we think that God owes us anything. We're, we're praying and God hears us because of his mercy and because he cares. Uh, and that's kind of puts you in your place. <laughs> um. And so our first thing that we're going to pray for is to pray for the needs of our professors and staff. So I'll give you like three minutes to to pray as a group for the professors and staff um, and faculty.
now we're going to have a time of prayer for the student body, um, for friendships to be strengthened, for students to continue to grow in their faith, uh, for the growth of the community that is central. Uh, next, I'm going to read First John 5.14. It says, This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Uh, so next, we're going to pray for the school to continue to build up servant leaders for the church, for God's blessing on our mission, uh, for God to continue to send students with a desire to learn and grow in his word.
And then one more scripture. Uh, we have James 5, 16. It says, therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. That's James 5, 16. Uh, for this last one, we're going to be praying for each other's personal needs in the group. Um, you'll have some extra time for this, so take your time. And then once you're done, quietly and respectfully move back to your seats. Uh, just be aware of the people around you that they may still be praying. Thanks.
Heavenly Father, as we have come together today to pray for these matters and to pray together, uh, I ask that you'll use these prayers in ways beyond what we can ask or imagine. Help us to share not only the, the joys of seeing you answer prayers, but to continue persistently in some of these things. Uh, and I ask that the opportunities that we have to, to pray together will continue and that we can find in those around us the, the proper support and the proper strength that we need uh, to make it through the, the struggles that we face. These things we pray in Christ's name. Amen. It's been a pleasure to have some opportunity this morning to lift up the campus and some of our needs. I don't know if I'm standing in a bad place here or not. Well, you're coming back to your chairs. I want to uh, let you know that I've had the opportunity in the last few weeks to make a couple of new friends from the Eastern European Mission, a uh, collaborative effort of uh, Churches of Christ to distribute Bibles in places where people don't normally have access to a Bible in their own language. And our speaker today is the Missouri representative of Eastern European Mission, Daryl Willis. He is the director of education for EEM. Daryl actually lives in Dallas. Now, I got to tell you, last night I went to pick up Daryl uh, at the airport in Columbia, and the first thing he told me was his flight had been delayed because it was overbooked, and they were trying to get three people to agree not to fly and take the money to not come. I said, well, how much money did it get up to? And he said, $800. I said, man, you should have just called me and kept the money. I mean, he, he could have taken the money and just said, sorry, I got, I got bumped. You're going to have to do something else. Well, that's the kind of man we have here. He would not do that. He would rather be here speaking with you today in Missouri than staying home and keeping the $800 to not be here to preach. So that told me all I needed to know about his commitment to making sure that God's word is preached. And Daryl has been working in lots of ways, both be, uh, at Eastern European Mission and before. He's, he's been a minister. He's been a youth minister. He's got his master's from Lipscomb University, uh, has worked as a chaplain for a police department. But today, Daryl is going to be sharing with us in our series about uh, God's word leaving a mark. And, and one of the things that we take for granted is even having a Bible, because we have so many of them. And I can put my hands on about 25 Bibles that are mine, that if I wanted to look at, I could grab them and compare passages and look at notes and things like that. But, but without that resource, it's hard for people to have God's Word make a mark on their life. And so today, as Eastern European Missions Ministry is uh, highlighted out in the lobby, and as Daryl preaches to us about God's Word, I hope you'll think about how important it is that we take steps to make sure as many people as possible have God's Word. We're going to watch a short video, and then after that video is over, we'll be uh, listening to Daryl Willis of Eastern European Mission. The Bible. the Bible, the Word of God, it tells the story of the life of Jesus and gives us the invitation to life and eternal life with God. Imagine every time you read this book and shared its life-saving message, you risked persecution, prison, or even death. Not long ago in post-Soviet Eastern European countries, this was the reality they faced. While the Bible is no longer illegal, there are still millions who do not have access to one in their language. And they, like us, crave that message of hope. EEM believes the Bible is the most powerful book in history and that everyone should have access to it. We print and distribute through a vast network of partner churches and organizations to provide Bibles and Bible-based materials to 30-plus countries in over 20 languages free to all. God's power is at work. He is building His kingdom, and He is inviting us to change the world by sharing the good news. The Bible. We want everyone to get it. Will you join? Good morning, Central. Good morning. How are you guys doing today? Great. Great. Yo, you are alive out there. That's, oh, that's super. Wonderful. 
Okay, well, who is Daryl Willis and who is EEM? Well, you heard a little bit about me already. I'll just fill in a few more blanks there. Yes, I am a native-born Texan. You can tell by my stature. Uh, Yeah, I won't go into that. I gave up a budding basketball career years ago when I was five. Um, I was in youth ministry for 18 years. I affectionately call that director of wildlife. And loved it, took a demotion, started preaching for 12 years in a town called Ennis, Texas. A nice Czech population, by the way. They like their polka real fast, their beer real cold. Uh, It's the home of the National Polka Festival, if that tells you anything. I'm usually gone that weekend, intentionally. Um, So I've been doing ministry for about 30 some odd years and then in 2009 I got recruited to start working with Eastern European Mission in a short term mission program that I ran taking teams of adults to go over to Ukraine to teach in the old communist youth camps. We taught biblical character in secular camps and distributed Bibles there. Well, now, in 2017, my role has changed, and now I wear a dozen hats, and it's really kind of fun just trying to juggle those things and trying to remember which hat I'm supposed to be wearing on which day. But who is EEM? EEM began in 1961. In 1961, a a couples, a group of couples came over. They were your age to Vienna. Yeah, go ahead, show that. Yeah, this is the couples. They came, just graduated out of ACC, Abilene Christian College, now ACU. They moved to Vienna, and they decided that they wanted to reach out to the communist bloc, the Soviet bloc that was developing right during that time. In fact, it was the same year that the wall went up in Berlin. They moved to Vienna, Austria, and there they enrolled in university with no intention of ever taking a class. What it provided for them was visas to be able to travel throughout Eastern Europe. And so they began traveling throughout Eastern Europe, seeing the lay of the land and reaching out into it. They believed, and they still firmly held in it, it's formed our own psyche. They believed in the words of Isaiah chapter 55. And we're going to throw that, that up there real quick. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return until it has replenished the earth, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so is my word that comes out of my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish the purposes for which I sent it. They believed in that. And as they believed in that, we believe it too. It has formed who, are, who we are and what we, what we believe in as we're talking and going throughout Eastern, European, uh, Eastern Europe and Central Europe as well. Well, that's not the only thing that formed us as well. We have another passage of uh, Scripture that forms us as well. And that is Mark chapter 4, verses 1 through 19. You may know the story. It's a parable that Jesus tells. We've got another couple of slides up there, if you'll throw that up there. The next one over. Yeah, remember the story of the parable? The, or the parable of the, the seeds, the scattered seed. Real simple, it's probably one of the few allegorical parables that are told in the New Testament. Jesus talks about this farmer going out and he's scattering seed that lands in four different soils. And each of those soils represent a heart. The seed, he says, is the word of God. One soil in particular is a good soil. And from that springs forth this healthy, growing plants. And it would be six, thirty, sixty, a hundred times what was sown. And that's the word of God. Now, I want you to notice something about that parable, though. And I don't want to stretch it too far. But you notice the power is not in the one who sows the seed. The power is in the seed itself. And notice something else. The sower is not told, the farmer is not told to find out which soil is the best soil to sow in. He just scatters the seed. And I think there's a couple of reasons for that because if we were responsible for figuring out which soil was the best soil and we cultivated and we did all that work and all that research and then we planted the seed and it actually grew, who gets the credit for that? We do, right? I mean, we did all the work. We did all the research, so we did it. And God gets none of the credit. But the other thing I think is probably more accurate is that we're not very good at this sort of thing. We're 
not great at finding out which soil is the best soil and which soil isn't. We look at this one person over here and we say, this person is going to be really receptive to the word of God. And then we share and we cultivate and we work and they have absolutely no interest. And then we see this guy, old boy over here, we're going, yeah, he has absolutely no interest at all. And so we just kind of half-heartedly give him the word. And next thing you know, it just blossoms and grows in his life. And they just totally take us by surprise. So that's kind of the way we look at it. We believe that we scatter the seed. The power is not in the one who scatters the seed. The power is not in our ability to find which soil is. We just believe in getting the word of God to as many people as possible in a language that they understand. Now we know this works. We know this is true because we've seen it over and again. God fulfilling the promise of Isaiah 55. God fulfilling the promise of the scattered seed into good soil. God tell you about Ivan Martos. Ivan Martos was a, a believer in Hungary during the communist era. During the 70s, early, very early 70s, we worked with him I didn't work with him. I was way too young back then, all right? Uh, But uh, EEM worked with him in smuggling Bibles into Hungary, and he kept the Bibles, and he helped distribute those Bibles. He was a banker in the banking industry of Hungary. Now, occasionally, he was able to come into Vienna. His father had been uh, an author and had made money through his works, and so he was still getting royalties, And so he would go into Vienna and collect the royalties. I don't understand how all that works, but that was the story I've been told about that. He would come in, he would conduct business in Vienna, and he would come by train. The team would meet him at the train. Now, Ivan was this kind of guy that was bigger than life, and he would just bounce off the train whenever he came. You know, man, everything's great, everything's wonderful. Well, one day they're waiting on him, and he drags off the train. He looked like someone had died. He said, Ivan, what's going on? He said, terrible. I lost my Bible. You lost your Bible? What happened? Well, security on the trains is not that big of a deal. You know, you get on the train, you get close to the border, the guards come by and they stamp your papers, right? Well, there was another guy with the guards this time, and I don't know if he was Secret Service or whatever, But as they're stamping our papers, he looks at my briefcase and he says, open that up. He said, I opened it up and there's my Bible sitting right on top. He picks it up, he rifles through it and he says, what's this? And I told him, I said, it's my Bible. He said, I know it's a Bible. What are you doing with the Bible? He says, well, I'm a believer and it's my Bible. He says, this is an embarrassment. This is a book of myths lies, and Western propaganda. You're not going to need this anymore. The train, it was a summer day. The windows were all down. They were going around 60 miles an hour, he said, and he just threw the Bible out the window. Yvonne said, I'm just crushed. And they said, oh, it's okay, Yvonne. You know, we're in the Bible business, right? We'll get you another Bible. He says, I know you will, but that's not the point. It's my Bible. It has my notes in it, my underlines. I know where Romans 6 is. It's on the right-hand corner, right-hand column of the left-hand side. You know, I know where it is. I know where everything in this Bible is. He was inconsolable. Fast forward a couple of years. He's still traveling back and forth. They meet him at the train station, and he doesn't bounce off the train. He doesn't drag off the train. He floats off the train. He said, Yvonne, what's going on? He says, I got my Bible back. What? In the mail. He said, it's my my name and address was in the Bible. And it was a village near the border. And there was a note in it. It says, dear Mr. Martos, we are so sorry we've kept your Bible for these two years. But some of our boys were playing by the railroad track two years ago and they discovered it laying there and they brought it to some of the older people in our village and they recognized it as the book. And we would have sent it back to you immediately, but it's taken us this time to hand copy our own copy of it for the village. And there are 60 believers now, baptized believers, and if you ever want to come and visit us, please, 
please do. We would love to welcome you. Power of the word, folks. Power of the word. You can't make this stuff up. Now, there is a story that, you know, it's one of these preacher stories which really offends me. All right, the preacher story, okay, usually means it's a lie. Um, but <laughs> don't you hate that? I mean, why is that the case? Okay, so we're given to exaggeration. Um, this, uh, the story is told about this fella. He's handing out Bibles in Eastern Europe, and this one guy's looking at a New Testament. And by the way, this is one of the original New Testaments that we smuggled. A good smuggler could get 180 of these on him. We called it the Marlboro Bible because of obvious reasons, you know. Um, but at any rate, um, this guy was handing out Bibles like this, a little thinner paper. And this guy was looking at the Bible and he's saying, hmm, you know, that paper to make good cigarette paper. The guy said, oh, no, please. I'm not going to ask for it back. I gave it to you. It's yours. But would you do me a favor? Would you read it before you smoke it? <laughs> okay. So, a few years later, he runs into this guy at an evangelism seminar. And the guy said, hey, you remember me? He says, no, I don't. Who are you? He says, you gave me a Bible a few years ago, and I told you the paper would make great cigarette paper. Oh, yeah. (laughs) What are you doing here? (laughs) I'm teaching a class. You're teaching a class? Yeah. So, what happened? Well, I smoked my way through Matthew, Mark, and Luke. By the time I got to John, I had to become a Christian. (laughs) Now, I don't know if that's true, okay? But I know a guy named Feda Chernitskini. And I hope I... Chernit, Chernitkivy. I hope I pronounced his name right. Uh, I, I consider him a friend. He'll probably kill me that I can't pronounce his last name with a flip. Uh, but Feda. Feda had a similar experience. Ukrainian, age 14. He was in and out of one prison after another. He said... My family taught me that I am a god. Says my family is not a nice family. I got the distinct impression they were Ukrainian mafia. He said, so I've been in prison starting at age 14. And he says, at one time, you know, you have nothing to do. There's 50 guys in one room and a hole in the floor, okay? And he says, and there's nothing to do except beat each other up. And uh, someone gave a box of Bibles He says, one guy, he actually was smoking it, reading it and smoking it, you know, and that's what he was doing. But he gets to the end of Matthew about the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus, and the guy just breaks down in tears and starts crying, God, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, please forgive me, please forgive me of my sins, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So he's upset everybody, we all beat him up, you know. But it was like he didn't even notice us as we beat on him. It was like we weren't even there. He just kept crying out to God over and over again. He said, I picked it up occasionally a couple of times because I didn't have anything to do either. But it was kind of confusing, so I didn't. I just kind of put it down until the day I got the news that my mother hanged herself. He said, then I picked it up, and I started reading it. Still in prison, by the way. He says, I got to John chapter 13, and I knew that my life was a mess, and I had to give it all up. And I decided from that moment on, I'm going to follow this Jesus that this book is talking about. So it took me a little bit later before I was able to connect with the church, group of believers. I ended up going to a a Church of Christ school, Ukrainian Bible Institute in Donetsk at the time. Now it's located in Kiev. He said, uh, changed my life. I I went not to be a preacher. I went to, to learn how to evangelize and share good news with people. And that's what he does. He now works with with older orphans as they're transitioning out of orphan care into adult, adulthood, trying to help them not make the mistakes that he made. He also preaches in Poltava. Started off a, a couple of years ago with two people. Now there are over 60 people in that church that he preaches for. You see, it's the power, again, of the word of God, the power that God is able to accomplish through his word. Just talk to my friend Oleg, well, not my friend Oleg, uh, to my friend Dirk Smith, who's my boss, actually. But he was talking with one of our representatives in Russia, Oleg Yamaniko. Oleg is one of, our, uh, one of our workers. I know Oleg. Oleg said when he was 16 years old, the wall came down. And they heard about this book, this book that told the future. 
Okay, his theology was a little messed up on some of this, okay? But they were really interested in finding this book. Him and his teenage buddies, they were looking for this book called the Bible. And, you know, and he was told when he found a copy, he says, read it, read the back of the book, read Revelation. He says, man, because you talk about the mark of the beast, that man, that's Gorbachev, we knew, you know. <laughs> and he, started, he said he read Revelation, he says, this is the most confusing thing I ever read, I gave up on it. A couple of years later, someone says, no, 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 you need to read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Because I think you'll like the person that it talks about. He said, I started reading about this Jesus he said, I fell in love with him. And I knew that I had to connect with what he was about and find some way to spread doubt to other people. And so now he works with us distributing Bibles in Belarus and Russia. I can tell you about Yasser. Yasser, who is a refugee from, Iran, or from Afghanistan. He came in through Greece. His wife received the Bible. She told him, I'm thinking about following this Jesus Christ. He said, if you turn to Christianity, I will either kill you or I'll divorce you and send you away. But because he was unemployed, he had nothing to do. His wife had brought one of our Farsi Bibles home. And he had nothing to do, so he started reading it. As he started reading, he said, things became more and more clear to me. And I knew at that moment after I started reading and really asking questions that I either had to stay in my nothingness and refuse life or accept it. Now he works through the Glafada Church of Christ working with other refugees trying to bring them to Jesus. I'm telling you, it's the power of the word of God. But it's not magic. It's not ink and paper. It's the one whom this word points to, the word, Jesus himself. Because this message, we talk about the sword, the spirit, the tool of the spirit. This message is what God uses to intersect our lives and to show us who Jesus is. That's where the power is found. And that's where I want to challenge you guys. Because, you know, we don't see very many stories like that in the United States. We don't hear very many stories like this. I mean, how many teenage guys do you know are actively looking to find a Bible to read it? How many folks just say, man, i got to read that text and just pop it open and read it because they're so excited to find a word that leads to life? Maybe, maybe it's because we've not engaged with the word here. Maybe it's because familiarity breeds contempt. And because, how many Bibles, 40-something that you said you had? I have, I, have 20, I have 20 versions of the Bible, English versions in my home. English versions, you know. Maybe we need to dust those things off and begin to read them for ourselves and engage in the Word, not for an intellectual pursuit, but to encounter the one to whom they point. And that's where my challenge for you today is. Get into the Word. Got three words for you, ready? And this is what I want to leave you with. Read, share, discuss. Hard to remember. So let's say it together. Okay, ready? Read, share, discuss. One more time. Read, share, discuss. Okay, you can go home now. No. Yeah, this is what I want to challenge you to do. First, read the Word. And I don't mean read a verse here, verse there. Don't do a devotional reading. It's, again, it's not magic and it's not legalism. Read it the way it was written. Take a book like Mark. Read it every day. Take a week with it. Absorb it. Read it all the way through. Don't just read little blurbs here. I'm not a big fan of read the Bible through in one year because I'm not in speed reading. It's okay if you do. That's fine. But read it and absorb it. What if you just read the book of Mark all year long and suddenly it was integrated into your life? Would that be a bad thing? I don't think so. But then after you read it, asking yourself three questions, what resonates with me in this text? What bothers me in this text? What, what's really bugging me about this text? And what is God calling me to do with this text? How is God calling me to live? Ask those three questions. And then begin sharing it with other people. Now, I'm not talking to get weird or anything like that. But, you know, I could, this is the Gospel of Mark, by the way. 
English Standard Version, I believe. There's a lot of different versions you can use. But, you know, get you a copy of the book that you're reading. And share it with your friends. Hey, you know, I've been reading this real weird book called Ecclesiastes. You ought to read it. Here's a copy. You want to read it? I have no problem sharing with people what I'm reading. I'm a Dean Koontz fan. Okay, Odd Thomas, anybody? Uh, I, I love Dean Koontz. Uh, just, I know that says Daryl is officially weird. You probably already figured that out by now. Um, but I have no, I'm, I'm never threatened when I tell people that. What you're reading today? Man, I'm reading Dean Koontz. Great book, you know? Yeah, I got a copy. You want to borrow it? Be glad to give it to you. Why don't you do it with the Bible? But don't say I'm reading the Bible. Say I'm reading Ecclesiastes. I'm reading, I got, if you're into poetry, I got this great book called Psalms. Wonderful book. Or I'm reading this particular book here. And then just give it to your friends. I don't think you'll be rejected by doing that. And then discuss it. You know, asking people to join you in a Bible study is real threatening. Asking them to discuss a book in a book club isn't. Been re- you want to read this story about this family that's undergoing all kinds of difficulties and struggles and they've given up on life in general, but it's also this incredible love story. It's called Ruth. Why don't we just read that this month? Everybody read that this month. We're going to come together and then we're going to talk about it and then ask those three questions again of your friends. What resonates with you? What bugs you? And if God were speaking, if God were speaking through this, if you believed in God and he were speaking through this, what would he be telling you? Non-threatening, but it engages people in the word of God. So that's what I want to leave you with. Take the word of God with you. Engage in it by, first of all, reading it. Second of all, sharing it. Give it to others. And thirdly, discuss it with each other and discuss it with your friends. And I think you will find that those hearts, that good soil, will accept that word and God can make something grow out of it. But we got to be willing to do those things. So, may you experience the life-transforming power of the word of God. May you not keep it to yourself, but may you creatively engage with it and creatively share it with your friends so that they will encounter he to whom this word points, the word of God himself, Jesus the Messiah. God bless you and thank you. We have one more message in our series of sermons on heritage of biblical authority. That's going to leave a mark. It'll be Friday, and Jason Posnick will be preaching to us this Friday. It's also In Focus Friday, so we'll be uh, sharing with our uh, guests uh, a little taste of how important the authority of the Bible is here at Central Christian College of the Bible. Daryl has pointed out to us today that there are lots of ways that we can creatively get it in other people's hands. And when I looked at some of the resources they have available in different languages for different countries and different ages. It's really quite impressive. I hope that you'll spend a little time talking to Daryl today. He'll be here the rest of the day. He'll be speaking in a couple of classes today, including the class immediately following chapel in room 134, uh, Michael Curtis's class. If you don't have a class you'd like to go to uh, or that you have to go to, then then, uh, that's a class you can come and visit. Uh, They have some space in there. But uh, Daryl has a table out front. He'll also be in uh, Mr. Curtis's class at uh, 2 o'clock this afternoon as well. I think you'd be surprised the different ways that Eastern European Mission can help you in your ministry and how you could help them in their ministry. And exposing you to them is part of a core value we have here uh, called Kingdom Collaboration. We want our students to realize that without interacting with others who are doing very specific and specialized things, uh, we miss out on opportunities to, to bring a blessing and to grow our own ministry and our own church. Uh, and so this is one of those ministries that I think would be uh, very valuable to you in many ways to, to get associated with. I want to thank those of you that were involved on Friday with our Heritage Day. 
Uh, I heard uh, really, really good comments from our guests that day. Uh, they enjoyed being in chapel. They enjoyed seeing the, the facility here. You guys making the, the room set up for them was really helpful. We didn't want them to have to do that. It was very comfortable for them to be here. Last year, we took the event elsewhere because we were sort of wondering whether it fit well here with uh, students and guests at the same time. And so after trying that a year, we decided to try it back this way and compare. And, and really, it was, it was quite a great experience for them. And I hope it was for you as well. There are a lot of times that we have guests on campus. And for those of you that are new, many of you attended an In Focus Friday. In fact, if you're a student here that attended an In Focus Friday before you came here, I'd just like you to stand real quick. If you ever attended an In Focus Friday. All right. So our next In Focus Friday is on Friday. You guys can be seated. Friday, September 7th. Now, I have talked to many of you who went to an In Focus Friday during my new student interviews, and I have found from you how meaningful that day was for these reasons. First, because you got to meet some of the staff, and the staff were really uh, welcoming and helpful. And so our guests who are here on Friday are expecting to, to do that as well. On uh, second thing that you guys have told me that you benefited from In Focus Friday was the ability to, to see the facilities and, and make it feel like it was home to you. So I'm going to ask you to help us have things looking their best on Friday, as in, you know, lobbies, trash on the ground, common areas like the hallways and the cafeteria. Because keep in mind, as people walk in, that's their first impression. And something that you see that you left around, but you think, oh, somebody else will throw that away. You know, that somebody else can just as easily be you. So uh, keep the place looking good so that when they come on Friday, they, they will have a great first impression of the campus. And then the last thing that I've heard you say is how important it was when you came here that students talk to you. In fact, I've heard that at other schools, that just doesn't happen. You go visit and you get the, the professional presentation and all of the sessions, but you never really get to see a student. Now, you know, don't, you don't have to uh, talk to every single person who's here and every single student doesn't have to talk to every single person who's here, but just be natural and make them feel welcome. Make them feel like if they have a question, you're you're happy to answer it. If they look around like they don't know where they're headed, ask them if you can point them in the right direction. It really does make a great impression on them when they come and visit. And that's one of those things here that, that we do that really sets us apart. We try to give personalized attention to our students, to our prospects, to our supporters. And, and hopefully you realize that you're part of that. Your effort is part of that. So we're going to pray for uh, In Focus Friday for not just this week, but for the remainder of the year that we can have the best possible outcome of that. And we're also going to pray that today what we have heard will be something that leads us. Let's stand and let's close in prayer and then we'll be dismissed. God, we thank you today for the seeds that are planted in so many ways, the seeds in, in your word that we are just uh, expected to, to scatter and, and share in ways that you will use beyond what we can ask or imagine. We don't even know sometimes when we give someone a word of truth or give them a, a scripture that, that we're not using how that might be uh, absorbed by them and, and change their lives. So help us look for opportunities to do just that. And help us also see ways that we can plant seeds with others, even this week as we come to chapel together, as we eat together, as we welcome students to visit our classes. I pray that those seeds will be received by them and that if it is your will that they will see this is a place that they want to come and train, learn your word, make relationships and prepare to serve. Thank you for the messenger of this hour, for the ministry that he has through EEM around the world. And I pray that we can be part of seeing your word given to as many people as possible to glorify Christ in whose name we pray. Amen. Thanks for helping us with the chairs and you are dismissed.
of creation there at the start before the beginning of time with no point of reference you spoke to the dark and fleshed out the wonder of life And as you speak, a hundred billion galaxies are born. In the vapor of your breath, the planets form. And if the stars are made to worship, so will I. I can see your heart. Chase down my heart through all of my failure and pride. On the hill you created, the light of the world abandoned in darkness to die. And as you speak. Billion fans, this 